Uh, so without further ado, I would like to invite Nidza, Dr. Nidza Kadish. Dr. Nidza, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, we'd like to invite Dr. Nidza to give her opening, uh, opening comments. Dr. Nidza, over to you. Thank you very much, Keith. I'm so happy to be here again. Uh, shalom and good day to all of you, whether you are attending on-site at our offices or virtually. So I'm Nitsa Kardish, and I'm the Vice Chair of Trendlines Agri-Food Innovation Center, which in short we call AFIC. AFIC is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Trendlines Group, uh, is an incubator and the manager of Trendlines Agri-Food Fund, which invests in exciting global agri-food tech startups from early stage to later stage. So welcome to the demo day of the third Trendlines 3i Accelerator Program. Uh, this program is an uh, integral part of Trendlines' commitment to contributing to the development of the Agri Food Tech Startup ecosystem in Singapore. And today is also symbolically very important as it is also marks as the starting date of Singapore relaxing the COVID management measures. Uh, I still remember the big contracts of the time uh, when we had the first accelerator program in early 2020. This is a reminder of how we have uh, not just survived, but progressed despite uh, the, the pandemic. In Trendland, in trend lines, we truly believe, and also we know, that the journey of an entrepreneur is never easy, and often it is a lonely one. However, it can be a very rewarding journey uh, that brings positive impact to the world and also personally to the entrepreneur. And for that, I would like to applaud the five entrepreneurs who are pitching today for their resilience in believing their ideas and trying to make them materialize. Tapping on our group experience as the most active early stage agri-food tech investor in Israel, we would like to identify, support, and develop Singapore's startups to be global players across the value chain of agri-food sector. And to achieve this goal, we believe that it is crucial to advocate partnerships. We are thankful to have the. Uh, we are thankful um, to have the privilege to work with partners in Singapore, such as Enterprise Singapore, Innovate 330, Republic Polytechnic, Yan Lo, IPOS International as well as our global network of industry and investors partners. A special thanks to the Agritech team in Enterprise Singapore, Eugene Tong, Frida Sapper, Ink Su N, and Su A Ink. I hope that I didn't make terrible mistakes in pronouncing. Uh, for your continuous support and journey with us in uh, our effort to build an agri-food enterprise commit, uh, com community in Singapore. Even though we can be optimistic to say that the COVID pandemic could soon be behind us, the challenges of food security and climate change would continue to remain and even more than if we take no action. Technology and innovation are the key in solving those challenges. Therefore, we must continue to encourage innovation, to support it, and to build an ecosystem that allows startups to germinate and, of course, to grow. With that, uh, all the best for the five teams and for the audience. Enjoy the presentation and the networking time. Last but not least, Thank you very much to Anton, Keith, and Rachel, an amazing team in Singapore. Without you, nothing of that would happen. I will pass the time back to Keith. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nita. Thank you for your kind words. 
So during, I guess, during our little technical blackout, uh, I've already spoken a little bit about what the 3R accelerator is. I uh, mean, really, it's a, it's a three, uh, sorry, it's a 12 week program that is really a crash course for all the startups to give them the right vocabulary, the right words to say, and also to not just come up with an idea, but to really test that idea multiple times, right? We don't want to have solutions that have no problems that they're trying to solve. A lot of times you see people come up with bright ideas and right solutions, but when you ask them what's the actual problem, they're not very sure. So the three core principles of the 3i program is really to ideate, inoculate, and ignite. And uh, the ideate phase is where we tear down ideas. And actually, if you ask a lot of the startups, we are, I would say, infamous for actually closing down multiple ideas during the first three, uh, first three weeks of our program. But I think one of the core principles of having a good startup is really to fail fast and fail cheap so that you can get back up on your feet and then have your next idea. Secondly, it's inoculate. Inoculate, not really the best word to use in this current times, but I think the idea is to grow and spread as rapidly as possible. And to, in order to do that, that's where the networking comes in. We get them to meet the right people, meet the people who can give them the expert advice. And lastly, Ignite is all about this demo day, right? It's all about pitching. It's all about saying the right things. Sometimes as a startup founder, you have seen your startup for so long, you talk about it for so long, and when you try to explain it to someone else, people don't understand what you're talking about because only you understand what your startup's about. So the last one is really to simplify your message and to make sure that you get the right message across because nobody wants to have a, like a light a fire but hide it under a basket, right? We want the world to see the fire. So these are the three core principles of the 3i program. Uh, next, we want to thank our partners. Without our partners, none of this would have been possible. Uh, Samuel, I saw you earlier. <laughs> oh, okay, so... Uh, Samuel from Yuan Law has been really key in helping our startups understand the core principles of fundraising and to understand what's important in looking through some of the legal documentations, right? As a startup founder, everybody wants to raise funds, but over time you realize that fundraising is not the easiest thing to do. Of course, Enterprise Singapore, thank you for, you know, helping us lift up some of these measurements so that we could have our in-person gathering. Uh, and the team has been great to really help us reach different uh, IHLs and different corporates as well. Uh, we hope to continue to be a part of your program so that we can build this ecosystem together. Uh, the lastly, we'd like to thank Socialize and CoLab. Socialize, uh, Joel over there is a digital marketing uh, specialist that we have engaged. He helps us with a lot of our marketing workshops. Uh, JJ from CoLab, uh, he's at the back. He's really, he runs, he was part of our, uh, our previous cohort and he has also grown the company to a point where he can now support other startups. Uh, think of them as a lab space for higher Company, if you need lab spaces to do your testing, reach out to JJ, right? So he's over there. If you need to do a lot of lab testing, JJ is the guy to look for. And last but not least, our three judges for today. Thank you so much for taking your time out to speak uh, at this event. Uh, firstly, Mr. Eugene Toh from ESG. Uh, John Ching, Singapore's sweetest man in charge of, you know, the sugar. <laughs> uh, he's also the founder and managing director of Innovate360. And lastly, without... Yes. Anton needs no introductions. You guys know him very, very well. The CEO of Trendline Tech Food Innovation Center. And I, like I said, today is really a competition and there are rubrics to this competition. So for the five main criteria that we'll be looking at will be the differentiation of your technology, the feasibility of your business model, the potential of scale up, uh, the capabilities that you have within the team. And lastly, we'll be looking at the, the pitch that you're going to make, right? Like I said, it's always good to be able to have a good idea, but sometimes you need the right pitch to demonstrate the good idea. So each team will be given 15 minutes. Uh, our recommendation is that you present for 10 minutes and then take a five minute Q&A. Uh, questions will come from the judges as well as the online uh, participants. Okay, if we have additional time, we might take some questions from the floor as well. This evaluation criteria is actually adapted from ESG Startup Founder Grant. Uh, as we said, the accelerator is really just the beginning. It is not the, the, end, of, it's not the end of your journey. So we want to be able to set our companies up for success and really to prepare themselves for the next step, which is generally scaling up, looking for investments as well as grant opportunities. So we've adapted today's judging criteria to match some of these requirements from the market. Okay, and now I know you guys have heard enough from us, or from me especially. Uh, we'll start moving towards the pitch presentations. Our first presenter is Lalit. Lalit is from Sensgrass uh, and it's a soil intelligence platform that helps uh, farmers make the right decisions for their farms. Uh, Lalit is actually not in Singapore, so we'll be watching a video from him. Uh, and if he can connect, we will be able to do a, a live Q&A. Okay, so 
Hi, this is Lalit Gautam, the co-founder and CEO of SenseCross. It's a solid intelligence platform. Meet Marcelo. He's the senior procurement officer at PepsiCo and our client. Despite of spending millions of dollars to source the potatoes, he still get the poor quality and the low yield. And now meet Krishnamurti. He's a farmer working with PepsiCo and Marcelo. He completely based on an ancestral wisdom and without any accounting environmental variables, which means both have no idea how much resources, fertilizer they have to use in their field. These two people leads to the three huge problems, the use of excessive fertilizer, soil degradation, and the huge crop loss. Because we have no idea what's happening under the soil and what is our soil really required. And that's why we waste a lot of yield, huge carbon emission, and a huge financial loss as well. And now imagine a tool that gives you an actionable insight from the live soil data. Yes, we have designed and built the world's first farm uplink system that you reduce your cost by 40% and improve your lead by 20%. Let me tell you how. We use our proprietary soil sensor and combine the sensor data with the three additional data source like satellites, climate, and the user information. Calculate hundreds of ideal data points in our AI agronomist and give very personalized recommendations to the corporates and farmer to better decision making. So from a single software, you can process millions of data points in the milliseconds and simply manage your farm while sitting down in your office. Our dynamic AI use the information at a very dynamic level, fertilizer combination for a precise location, and that save huge cost and increase your yield. Because we're working below the soil with the nutrition and carbon management that make us one of the most competitive company with our own sensors, AI agronomists in a very less crowded market. In a nutshell, our farm OS convert any traditional large corporates or person into an innovative active company to manage your fertilizer carbon emissions to get higher income. Just because of the effective product, we have seen some great traction. We're generating around 20K USD MRR. We have seen 32% of the month-to-month -month growth, and we have around $1.8 million pre-paid bookings. And some of the large corporate clients are in our clients in the wait list. That shows how big is the demand and how important is the solution. This is we have achieved because of a simple, effective business model. We charge our clients on a subscription basis. That comes with the size of field and the type of crop. We give our corporates 6x ROI in return. And that's all. one of the good things about the solution is that it's completely free for the small farmers. This is also achievable because we are serving one of the biggest industry with the potential of high growth. We are here to seek your support. And this is why we're doing because we have around 30 years of experience, two successful exits and the perfect mix of business tech and science comes together to build this great product. We invite you to join this journey of future of food so we can feed our future generation. Thank you. All right, Lalit, are you, is your, is your camera working, Lalit? Sorry, he said, earlier he messaged us and he said he was online, so we just want to double check before we proceed. No? All right, if not, then we'll move on to the next presenter. Sorry. Okay, the next company that we have is Forte Biotech. Uh, it's really bringing you, bringing the lab to the farm, right? And I'll let Kit explain his company to you. Okay, thanks. Hello. Okay, cool. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kit, the founder of Forte Biotech. And here at Forte, what we do is to bring easy on-site diagnostics to prawn farmers around the world. This sounds like the most random combination that we can come up with, but it was really inspired by my uncle who used to farm prawns. So he was a successful prawn farmer. In fact, he used to drive a Porsche at the height of his business. However, he lost it all when he got an outbreak of the white spot virus. Overnight, 12 tons of prawns turned into just 70 kilograms. He went bankrupt. Stories like this are very common. And despite prawns being an integral part of our cuisines, not many of us know how prawns are being farmed. For instance, rural farmers in Vietnam just need to invest around $50,000, and three months later, it becomes $120,000. US 
This makes it a very, very lucrative trade. However, there is a high risk of diseases. And once the disease kills the prawns, they are not sellable. So the one on the bottom is a prawn that we found dead in our own tanks, which ironically got diseases. Yes, yeah, so diseases kill fast, overnight. The whole pond can be lost to diseases. In fact, we hear these stories when we went for our field tests in Vietnam. The dead prawns cannot be sold, so the farmers can't get their capital back. It is so pervasive that our farming partners have actually indicated that up to six out of 10 harvests are actually being affected by disease nowadays. What we do at Forte is to ensure that despite being affected by harvest, you can still sell all the prawns that you grow. How we do this is through an, our easy to use on-site DNA testing kit called Rapid. This way, farmers can perform the DNA testing themselves. It's kind of like PCR. So once they get the results, they are able to spot diseases quickly. And once they spot the diseases, they can then take action, whether it's to medicate or to harvest. This way, they still can sell the infected but live prawns so that they can get their capital back and even with profit. Our product is easy to use. We developed this product together with the National University of Singapore and with extensive consultation with our farming partners because we want to make sure that this is a product that our farmers will want to use in their farms for their livestock. The simple three-step process is something that we tested with them. All they need to do is to obtain the sample, whether it's the tissue from the prawn or the water. They can then extract the viruses and detect it all within one hour. There are already lab-based PCR tests and farmers use this service. However, they are not conducted frequently enough and they give results too slowly. You need around 24 hours to actually get any results, by which time it's already confirming what you already know. Everything's dead. What we want to bring is this one hour results. Once they know early, they can then focus on taking the right actions to preserve the value of their crop. No need to worry about how to pack the prawns for the test, what the results are, no waiting time. Get it straight away. Prawn farming is a big business. We estimate there are around 200,000 prawn farmers in Vietnam. And currently we feel that with the use of Rapid, they can earn up to two times more than what they are already earning. Our test, our business model is simple. People buy our device for around 300 to 400 dollars. And thereafter they will buy the reagents. These reagents are tested with the farmers ready and they have felt that $4 is a fair price to pay for these products. Moving forward, what we want to enable in our devices is to collect this diagnostic data. Once we have this diagnostic data, we can then build risk models, which can then be used to offer different services to the farmers. From our observations and our talks with the farmers, we feel that Financial services, as well as insurance, is really an underserved market in this region. And we feel that there is great potential to develop in this field. So once we have completed the MPV back last year, we have actually taken it down to Vietnam for a few usability trials, where we have spoke to the farmers about you know, the product and all that. We are currently raising a pre-seed round so that we can start the beta launch in August. We are launching in three farms across the Mekong Delta region in Bang Liu and Vung Tau province. Thereafter, we are actually increasing our reach to other farms in the Mekong Delta. And we hope to hit around 30 farms by the end of this year and then proceed on to the seed round. So we believed in the first few, in the first few years, we are looking at 10% month-to-month -month growth because that's how the word of mouth and the farmers spread. And thereafter, after the first year, maybe it's more stable, we will start looking at other countries in the ASEAN region. So currently we are raising around 100 to 150,000 Singapore dollars for our pre-seed. And this will generate enough cash flow for us to reach the sales of around 10,000 kits per month. And thereafter, we are looking to raise enough money to bring production in-house to produce around 100,000 kits a month. So our team, myself and Michael, we are the founders. So we both come from business families with dealings in Singapore, Malaysia, and Vietnam. So we are familiar with how operations work in these areas. Um, over in the ground in Vietnam, we have Alex who's helping us continue the outreach to the farmers, building on the momentum that we are already gathering. 
So yeah, thank you very much. That brings me to the end of the presentation. Questions? Thanks a lot, Kate. Eugene here. Yeah, cheers. A quick question. One is, can you explain a bit about the science, how you're able to get your one hour compared to your lab? Mm. So that's first question. Then my second question is, this is like the ART equivalent for prawns. Uh. What is the, you know, the false negatives mm, that mm. we talk about, right? Mm, and mm, the specificity. Mm. Yes. How does that compare to the PCR? Yes. Right. And what is the trade-offs uh, mm. when the farmers use this mm. to make real-time decisions? Understand. So um, first of all, how we make it so fast as compared to the lab-based test is because, so the technology that we use is something called LAMP, loop mediated amplification. So this technology is already being used in certain airports to test for COVID, for example. Mm. So this is a simplification of the PCR process, mm. which means that it's easier for us to build the machines and the sort of like reagents that we send out to the farms. How we save a lot of time for the farmers is that first of all, LAMP is a lot faster as compared to PCR, one hour versus six hours. And not only that, we reduce the transport time that is needed to take the samples from the lab, from the farm to the lab rather. So we really bring the lab to the farm. One hour, the farmers conduct the test themselves, they get the results back. So to answer the second part of your question about the accuracy, sensitivity, and the trade-offs. So accuracy is actually comparable to PCR. So we're talking about 99%. And afterwards, um, but of course, when we use in a few, it kind of drops to about 95 for the false negatives, this rate is actually lower than false positives. So part of it, our, our sort of protocol is to actually encourage farmers to do the test twice in case there is a false positive result. So if they get a positive result, they repeat the test to confirm it. So in terms of trade-off, we would say that this is a very sensitive um, molecular diagnostic test. So if the farmers are not careful, they may get a, 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 a false positive, but that's where we tell them to, you know, watch for their protocol and actually conduct the test again if they get a positive result. Mm. Okay. So how, how do you protect your technology? This is patented? Yes, this or has is been this patented. quite well, well deployed? It's, it's actually well patented deployed. already. Okay. And in fact, our, I would say it's part of our system such as the DNA purification. This is something that is novel. No one else in the world has been doing, uh, using our method of doing these things. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I just have a few questions like uh, in terms of accuracy, because you are testing one front off the whole point. So we're actually testing 30. Front. So 30. we didn't go really in depth into the test protocol. Yeah. So farmers will actually have two options. The first option is to gather a sample size. So going by statistics, we actually ask them to gather around 20 to 30 prawns. So this way they got a representative sample. Mm. The second way that they can do is actually to test the water in the pond itself. So this way they can actually get the, I would say like, say the free floating viruses and all that. So there are different uses for both of this. So in terms of like, say monitoring water intake for prawn farmers, right? Or as an overall sort of indicator of their prawn health. So this, we leave it up to the farmers to decide because they are the experts in that field and they should have the agency to take that decision. Uh, and uh, so, so this tests for only for white spots or is um, a yeah, test? we test five diseases at the moment. So apart from the well-known white spot disease, we also have uh, EHP, we have EMS, early mortality syndrome. We are also working on Taura syndrome virus as well as Monodon baculoviridae. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, one last question for <laughs> yes. me. Sorry. Um, I want to know like, would it be easier if you have a real-time solution that you can keep testing uh, water quality as well as what was the main causes for these kind of diseases? Yes, so there are two reasons behind this. So first is weather, right? But we can't really control the weather. The second issue is water quality, as you rightly mentioned. So there are two aspects to water quality that we talk about. So first is like the temperature, pH and all that. So there are already startups that are doing this. But however, in our opinion, it, and the farmer's opinion, really, it's kind of like testing the, um, the PSI to see who has COVID in the room. It doesn't really make sense in that, in that way. So for them, what they want to see is they want to know if the virus is in the room or not. So that's the sort of feedback that we have been getting from the farmers. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kate. Uh, just one question from me. What is your 
um, manufacturing strategy for the the kit and the reagent? How are you going to scale that up? Yes, that's a great question. So for the early part of our field test, uh, not say field test, right? the beta launch, we have actually worked with suppliers from places like Taiwan, China, to actually produce the first set of reagents that we need. But moving forward, we feel a more sustainable and controllable way will be to move productions in-house into Singapore for us to have better control over the quality. So currently, when we make it in Vietnam, uh, sorry, in <laughs> China and Taiwan, we have, they are of course certified sub suppliers, but we feel that sometimes we need a quicker reaction time. So we bring the reaction, uh, the production in house. So that's what the second part of prime raising is for. <laughs> so eventually so, you will have uh, like a factory to, to, to build these two yes, uh, products a, a here in Singapore. Small production lab. Yep. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Even when you say the three to four dollar per reagent. Sorry. The, the, just now you mm -hmm. have that subscription model, right? So yes. the farmer has to use how many per day? Test for the plants? Um, actually, it depends on the sort of um, routine that they have. So, some of the farmers that we talk to, they say, okay, we will test between anywhere between one time a day to three times a month. So, we leave it up to them whether they want to test the water or the, um, what do you call that, the, the, the prawns itself. So, so each, is $3. Yeah. So, each disease, right, each disease that they test is $4. $4. Correct. So if I were to say I were to test my prawns for three disease and my water for three disease, that brings it to a total of twenty four dollars. Eh? Whoa, three. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just got lost in the math about yeah, twenty four dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. uh, any questions from the floor or Is it scalable online? to fish? Scalable to fish. Um. Yes. Yes, yes, we can. Actually, we have been speaking to SFA about this, but um, I would say that our focus is on prawns for now because we see that as a business use case. Prawns, big or small, if they are diseased, we can still sell them for profit. But for fish, it's not necessarily the same story. Um, so that is really up to the farmers. We are more familiar with prawn farming, not so familiar with fish farming. So it's important for the fish farmers to come and tell us what they need. Uh. Yeah, so that's definitely the next step of development. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, next up we have Wesna, uh, Matthew, who will be able to tell us a bit more about how he's going to make cell cultures affordable. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Matthew, the founder of Wesna, which has the goal of making cell cultures and cultivated meats more affordable. How do we do this? Uh, with a method that we use to produce blood serum artificially. Uh, and we hope to replace conventional blood serums with this. So blood serums are used quite uh, ubiquitously across industries and life science uh, because uh, they contain a lot of growth factors which are necessary for cells to divide. First, uh, forward about myself. I'm a bioengineer originally from Belgium. I also went locally to Singapore Management University. I worked a couple of years for Siemens before I started my previous company, Smart Spruce. But for the last one plus years, I've been focused on Wasna. So Wasna is solving one of the biggest problems in cultivated meat, which is its cost. And uh, the vast majority of the cost comes from the growth factors that you need. And uh, usually, um, especially in normal cell cultures, you're still using something called fetal bovine serum, which as the name suggests, is derived from bovine fetuses. Next to the rather unethical origin of this blood, um, animal blood also contains um, a risk of contamination with um, diseases that we're sadly all too familiar with in the past years. Um, there's another problem, and that is batch-to-batch -batch variation. Every animal is different, and therefore also their blood. And if you want to do experiments, you want to have some uh, similarities between your experiments, and this is not always uh, uh, possible here. But uh, then again, uh, uh, blood serums, they are universal. They work on every single animal cell culture, and uh, they also do not require any adaptation, and they perform very well. Um, however, due to the consistency issue, what um, uh, bigger companies such as Merck, for example, uh, what they try to do is make serum-free media. And a medium is the, the nutrient-rich um, liquids that you feed to your cells in order for them to have the building blocks to build uh, their cell components. 
and then you also add growth factors to it. Originally, this also came from blood, but uh, lately we've been able to make these recombinantly, which is a technique to um, get the gene of, for example, a human growth hormone, and you uh, transplant this gene into a microorganism in order for uh, to produce this at larger scale. Uh, then what you do is you mix a multiple of these different growth factors together in the medium, and then you give this to your cells. Uh, sadly, this is usually very specific for your cell line or even cell strain, and uh, therefore they, they are not usually universal. Uh, then again, uh, bigger companies like Merck, they uh, try to do this quite often. Uh, why is mainly because of the consistency and the safety that pharma grade components require. Um, a couple of uh, my competitors in the cultivated meat space, what they try to do is kind of the same thing, but uh, make it uh, less safe because the requirements are less for food grade things. Uh, but the, then again, as a return, you have something that's more affordable. So um, we can uh, now confidently say that our product is ideal for cultivated meat. Why? Because it's technically we're growing um, uh, blood serum outside of the body. So it's highly performing like FPS. I can show you later how. Uh, it's also universal across the cell types that we grew. It's safe and ethical and most importantly for cultivated meats at scale, it will definitely be affordable. Therefore we can say um, it solves kind of all the issues with blood serums. Um, we've uh, demonstrated uh, back in 2021 that uh, this serum works universally. We tested on the cells that came from the three germ layers that your body is made of. This is mesodermal tissue, such as uh, bone, fat, muscle, and blood. Then you also have endodermal tissues. For example, if you want to make foie gras, you will uh, grow liver cells. It's quite a different cell type from these other ones. Then you also have ectodermal cells, which are the most primitive. And that's, for example, neuron tissues and also skin. We also expect with our uh, conventional bioengineering techniques to scale our production up to have a reduced uh, production cost of roughly 20 to 30 times. We expect with optimization to, be, to have something that is rather cheap. And um, if you look at existing blood serums, they're actually quite expensive. The um, uh, fetal bovine serum is also called liquid gold because it's about $1,200 per liter. Human blood is even more expensive, up to $3,400 US dollars per liter. So um, cultivated meat, of course, they try to reduce as much as possible. But then again, the cheaper the product, the more they can produce. So therefore, we think we are in an ideal place to help cultivated meats uh, come to fruition uh, because our broad, the blood is blood serum is recombinant free. And uh, also interesting to say is that um, one other problem with recombinants is that because they don't have a long history uh, of existing, uh, they also have more regularity requirements. That's why the cultivated chicken that we can buy in Singapore is actually made with fetal bovine serum. Uh, hopefully these rules will change quite soon uh, for the, the good of the industry. Um, but uh, ideally, we will, of course, be the media and uh, the serum producer where, um, where cultivated meat companies can use to grow their products. Um, and our market size is uh, quite big, actually, especially if you uh, will include the, the drastically expanding cultivated meat industry. But the existing serum market, which excludes cultivated meat and is purely focused on life science, is already a multi-billion dollar industry. And um, we can actually produce both human uh, blood serum and animal blood serum. And uh, therefore, we're actually expected to split the IP into two, uh, of which one part will be licensed out and then full focus will be put on the others. They both have their advantages and disadvantages. And you can see this in the traction that we have. We actually have a first contract with a large German MNC that is focused on tissue engineering and actually also produces recombinants and serum-free media. And they are very interested in trying it out. Uh, and that, that's why they bought samples uh, to see if it works universal across their cell cultures. Uh, we also have an MTA with Merck. Uh, then again, this takes quite a long time. And we hope to co-develop the livestock uh, serum with uh, CDMO that is active in cultivated meats. In order to get there, we will require roughly 720,000 US dollars to create uh, two novel cell lines, scale this up to production, and then also ship samples to our first customers. Uh, we will do that across the next 18 months and uh, first focus on the cell line development, then on upscaling to eventually also uh, have a demonstrable product. And for this, we would like to focus on pate, 
which is a French dish that actually contains a lot of different tissues. So usually it's made of a mixture with liver and, um, and muscle cells. And because these tissues are quite different from each other, this would be an ideal product to show uh, the universality of our serum. Um, uh, here are some contact details if you're interested uh, to have follow-up conversation. Interesting to notice that um, I'm incubated here at Trendlines and also at the Singapore Management University. Uh, that's it, uh, open for questions. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, first question is, is there a story behind your name of the company? Uh, yes, um, Wasna is a Native American food that is also a mixture of different components. Usually it's made of, it's made of uh, fats and of uh, dried beef and of uh, berries. And uh, Native Americans used to make it when they go trekking for a long time in the mountains. I thought this is quite ideal as a product due to that. Interesting. Second question is, once you get to scale and your cost, cost comes down, it looks like your product is superior to all your competitors. To why extent, would, why would somebody not use your product? Um, what I, I noticed from, uh, specifically from cultivated meat companies is sometimes their core competency is having a serum-free media that is made with recombinants and they need some conviction to, be, uh, to, to shift back to something that is essentially uh, a serum uh, product. So that's uh, the, the main barrier that I would see in cultivated meats. And the other industries in a um, highly specific scenario in life science would be if they, if they need to do experiments that are very specific, that they need to know exactly what's in there. And uh, because um, our serum is, is complex, it contains a lot of different things. So it will actually take a while before we figure out what exactly is in there. Like I already know that is at least eight different growth hormones in there, uh, some, some attachment factors, a lot of different things. So it will take uh, quite uh, some experiments to, to figure out this is exactly what's in there. And this would be some a barrier for some, but then again, if they use FBS, they will definitely shift to this. Thanks for your presentation. Um, just wanted to know, so for, for, for this, where is your, your source for this, uh, for your cell lines? Uh, where the, the cell lines are sourced from, this yeah. is from biopsies. So uh, just like with, with cultivated meat, what you do is you take a biopsy of cells from uh, an animal. Uh, so usually this is, of course, a living animal. Uh, it's kind of the same process, but then again, I need to get different cell types to so, get to my serum. So you're planning to do this in Singapore? Uh, yes. Because there's always an issue of getting livestock, right? Yes, it is. Uh, it's quite a big issue, but I'm uh, pretty sure I figured out now, thanks to uh, SFA, um, the Singapore government part that focuses on that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Matthew. Um, my first question, what, to what scale that it will bring your cost to below 60 USD? So... Um, maybe I should go back to that slide. Um, there's actually a multiple of methods that you use to, to get to this point. And um, uh, some of them are, are very standard, uh, standard use. So first of all, you have the density increase. Um, my density of my, my current cell culture is, is quite low on purpose to keep everything stable for my experiments. Um, normally you can get this to 10 to often 100 times higher. And uh, for, for this number, I put 10 times higher. Uh, another way on how to do this is recycling of your medium. So you, the, the, the things that I need in order to, uh, for my cells to grow, you can recycle this. Uh, I took uh, three times recycling, which is something I've already tested. So this should definitely be possible. Um, usually cultivated meat companies, they get to five to often 10 times that amount, mm. which will definitely bring it lower than 60 US dollars. So this is actually just a bioengineering techniques. Uh, the density increase should take roughly six months, according to a professor from ASTAR. Okay. So to bring to that level, I mean, is there any limiting factor besides the fact that you just need CAPEX uh, to, to um, get the equipment? So um, limiting factors, yes and no, in the sense that um, all, all the techniques that will be used are standard across the industry for decades, uh, luckily. Um, but then again, this will take a while. So this, it's, it takes a while to, to get to that point, um, six months to get 10 times density, and then recycling will, will require different equipment. Okay. Um, my last question is on the regulatory requirement. Uh, you mentioned that 
if it's a food product or cultivated meat, and then you will need the uh, regulatory approval for using your serum, right? Yeah. But for the use of your serum in whatever industry, is there a requirement to get it uh, uh, certified or approved? before yeah. using it? So um, I, I will divide the question into three. You have life science, you have actual use in human for therapy, then you have cultivated meat. Uh, the first one uh, requires UMP compliance um, because how my cells grow, it's actually going to be less requirements, I think, than uh, conventional sourcing of animal blood, um, which um, would require some ISO standards and of course GMP compliance. Uh, cell therapy will require um, FDA approval, will require clinical testing, will take quite a long time of course, uh, but should be possible eventually, hopefully. And uh, cultivated meats, um, the industry is still evolving the requirements, especially in Singapore, uh, mm. the first country in the world that accepted it. Um, but as I said, only FBS is allowed for now. Mm. I think in the next year, hopefully they will start allowing recombinants. If they allow recombinants, mine will definitely be allowed because technically the, the, protein, the proteins are not recombinants, which means that they are natural. Mm. So they, they should have less requirements in that sense. But I do not know the exact requirements. I cannot tell you, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Okay, just got one last question. Uh, who, how big is your team right now? Um, I'm on paper. I'm a sole founder. I see. Okay. Yes. Um, and are you looking to yes. hire scientists, or <laughs> you'll be doing the cell lines? So, um, for hiring, uh, I, I want to hire a couple of uh, people, but I'll also look for a co-founder specifically in the, uh, ideally in the blood serum industry. So there's a couple of companies, for example, CSL in uh, Australia. This is one example of a company that is specifically focused on getting components out, out of blood. And then they sell these components individually, for example, for hemophilia or other diseases. And um, this would be an ideal person if I can source someone with that background. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. All right, next we move from the high tech to the high rise. And we'd like to invite Ferlin to come and give her a presentation. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Ferlin from AgriTison. At AgriTison, we make urban farming easily accessible for everyone. Uh, just to give you a bit of uh, background context, so we currently live in a world of broken food system where one, there's not enough food in the world to feed the population. Two, current traditional agricultural practices are pollutive to the environment. And three, uh, food is very much less nutritious as we import them from overseas. So the solution is to have urban agriculture. A common form of agriculture, uh, urban agriculture is indoor farming. Uh, in Singapore, there are many land tenders for indoor farming, but you will realize that you hardly see any of their vegetables in uh, local supermarkets due to these limitations. Firstly, is the limited scalability as uh, urban agriculture has high capex costs. Second, the unsustainability of it as indoor, uh, indoor farms have high electrical consumption. So a typical indoor farm consumes 1,404 uh, kilowatts hour uh, per square meter per year. And this is equivalent to 350 of uh, four-room HDB flats in Singapore. And lastly, the high labor costs as urban cities have relatively higher salaries to pay for their workers. So obviously, the solution is to have a scalable, sustainable, and affordable urban farming, which AgriTisan can achieve that uh, by using outdoor farms. Mm -hmm. So we are scalable by having a much lower capex cost. We are sustainable as we use natural uh, re renewables, and we are able to reduce the manpower and thus uh, having low uh, labor costs. So how agritation is a great solution to the pro to our problems mentioned earlier is uh, through our key technologies. So first, our hardware, which we turn it as the food pot growing system, our patent pending design uh, structure of uh, the design of the structure allows us to be hyper U, making us highly scalable and space efficient, which I'll elaborate more later on. Our auto agri farm management software developed by us. So it has an automated monitoring system that is capable of giving us live updates of the crops. So this reduces the reliance on manpower to do any physical checks. 
And lastly, our crop recipes, uh, which are formulas used for the nutrients for each type of crops that we have grown. So this crop recipe is data guaranteed to ensure optimal growth and consistent yield. So we also use only organic pesticide uh, in our farm so that our vegetables are always safe to consume. So these three key technologies put together uh, allows us to achieve uh, easy farming for everyone. So for our food pot growing system, as mentioned earlier, uh, we are hyper U. So we are capable of growing uh, up to 40 kilograms per month in just a 2.5 square meter space. And this is three times more, uh, three times the yield of conventional local farms out there in Singapore. Our system is capable of growing more than 20 types of crops and herbs. And we are currently venturing into uh, flowering and tuber plants. Uh, we are also near 100% sustainable where we use solar energy and rainwater to operate our system. And uh, we are focusing on rapid scaling with easy setup. So currently, as you can see from the picture, that uh, tower itself takes only just 15 minutes to set up. And we are aiming to bring it down lower to just uh, five minutes. Uh, as for our software, it is also highly scalable. And uh, because it is able to produce a consistent yield with our crop recipes that uh, derive from our historical data that we have. So uh, the software itself has three key uh, main features. So firstly, as mentioned earlier, uh, it is able to capture live data. So uh, to give us essential readings such as the pH and EC of plants. So to ensure the optimal growth that we have. Second, uh, we are able to control the system's pump through the app as well. And lastly, it is able to send any alerts whenever a system is down. So all these features in the software reduces the manpower to do any physical checks on the farm. So with our novel, every tech comes with our creative business model. So uh, we term those uh, people who want cheaper and fresher crops or those who want passive investments as co-farmers. And our business model runs as a subscription base. So uh, the co-farmers just have to pay $200 per tower that they wish to subscribe. And they will re in return, they'll receive 40 kilograms of crops per tower that they subscribe, which uh, this is a, uh, worth $400. And these co-farmers are, are free to eat, sell or share under Agritizen's name. Uh, so as for our revenue growth, so this year we managed to have a $50,000 revenue. So all this is from the uh, year end running sales of our systems. So albeit this is from the education sector, but this goes to show how attractive our systems are, easy to maintain and easy to operate. So uh, our annual growth rate is worth, uh, worth up to 240% and we'll be able to break even by our third year uh, through continuous expansion of our farm. Uh, with a revenue of $30 million. So uh, Agritizen is able to stand out from its competitors uh, by achieving high yield while maintaining a low cost at the same time. So these two key factors are essential for Agritizen to achieve the easy uh, farming for everyone. So this is our uh, five-year timeline for our technology pathway. So this year, we're focusing on rapid sites uh, deployment. We are developing the structure to be deployed fast. Uh, so this not only brings down the cost, but allows us to replicate many of our rooftop farms. And uh, by 2023, we'll be venturing into enhanced carbon and food traceability. And by 2024, uh, we'll be licensing our technology and uh, continuous expansion of our farm. We'll also be looking into e-payments in the form of DeFi. And uh, this is our working capital needs. So most of our funds will be pumped into towers and uh, R&D. We also be focusing on manufacturing, uh, marketing, and other working capital. We aim to have a two-year runway with three rooftops by then uh, with a revenue of $1.7 million. So this is the team behind Agritizen. Uh, we come together with a common love, interest, and passion for agriculture and uh, agri-tech. So we have uh, Alex, who is the CEO. He has led two startups previously, and he's the one who came out with the tower design. So I myself specialize in customer and order fulfillment and have done this largely in the past myself. And we also have Clemens, who's in charge of the hardware and software engineering and has brought products to commercialization uh, before. 
Okay, so this is the end of my pitch. If you wish to continue a conversation with us, this is my contact details. And once again, I'm for agritizen, making farming easily accessible for everyone. Thank you. First question, yes. more fun on yeah. how, how did all three come together? Was it? I mean, you're all engineers by training. Uh, yeah. how, so, did the, how did the idea uh, come about? And tell so, us more about that. Okay, so uh, me and Clement, we are we are all from NUS, in fact. So uh personal story is that we were looking for internships during our summer intern. Then we were actually at another uh, startup company that uh helped is also under Alex, and then Alex wanted to do in this agriculture and then that's where he asked the both of us whether we are interested and that's where a hype about the SFA 30 by 30 came about so that's why we decided to be on board with him for this yeah okay interesting uh, the more serious question is on your business model yes you have 200 dollars that's per month per year Ah, uh, that's per month per month yes uh, question is how do you how do you guarantee that 40 kg okay so sorry. i mean what is your variation like you would have deployed it right is it always 40 kg yes we will always ensure that they will receive 40 kilograms of vegetables and okay so how do you how do you do that so our towers is capable of uh growing 40 kilograms of vegetables of course there'll be variations but uh the coal farmers they will be entitled to that one tower so if uh there will be if there isn't enough vegetables mm -hmm. for that month, we'll probably take it because we have uh set an uh, allocated number of towers for the coal farmers. So we do have backup towers. So if yeah. each tower for that month, let's say during the way rainy weather, the vegetables aren't doing as well as they're supposed to, we'll mm -hmm. take it from our backup stocks that we have to supply to these customers to and to guarantee them that 40 kilograms. Okay. So the farmer is. I know it's passive investment, but passive in the growing. So you don't need green fingers. No, no yes, you no. just watch and so the co farmers, magic. yeah. So the co farmers they have the, the choice to whether they wish to come down to do the gardening, the farming themselves, or they can just you know uh sit back and wait at home for their 40 kilograms of vegetables every month. <laughs> yes. So so you, you, they don't need to find a space. The 200 dollars includes uh the rental or some space you have. Oh, so it? it's just a, that tower. So we are charging based on just the tower, no yeah. rental fee. No, but the farmer has to find the space on his own or? No, so we have that tower set up on our farm. Then they oh, just I see. Rent. So the 200 includes the yes, space correct. already. Right? Yes, yes. Oh, nice. Interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, under your projections, I think there was one that you showed 200 dollars. The subscription is 200. Yes. Uh, $200 in 2022 and you're expecting every year to be $200? Ah, yes. So that year, the subscription oh, is $200. Per, yes. per, per tower. Per tower per, yes, correct. Ah, okay. Um, and, and so going back to, um, I think earlier on, you were mentioning about the coal farmer. Yes. So how are you finding these coal farmers? Okay, so uh, we previously had a focus group discussion with uh, interested participants from uh, Republic Poly because Republic Poly, there is this uh, part-time diploma for working adults who are interest, interested in agriculture. And uh, Alex, he's currently a student there. So he managed to have a focus group discussion with uh, his fellow uh, course mates and to share the idea with them about this co-farming co co model. And then uh, we currently have 20 to 30 of them uh, on our wait list because they are really interested to be a part of this co-farmer. Yes. And, and typically, what would their like, size or how many farms would they uh, averagely purchase or, or subscribe to? Sorry? Like averagely, how many of such towers would they subscribe to? Oh, uh, it's up to them how many towers that they wish to subscribe. Uh, from uh, the focus group discussion that they have, currently they are interested in just one because they just want to test out because this is a relatively new idea to them as well. So they just want to subscribe to one model and uh, they will see how things will go from there. And if they wish to subscribe more, they can obviously subscribe more towers. I see. And, and uh, one, one last question for me. Is there any challenges when you're growing these crops on the rooftop? 
uh, like insects and how do you mitigate that? Ah, okay, yes. So uh, obviously in an outdoor farm, there are two conditions to factor in, such as the weather, which uh, we can't control the weather. And second, which is the pest, like you mentioned. So for the pest, we use just purely uh, natural waste or organic methods. We don't use any chemical methods. Uh, chemical pesticide. So we have uh, biocontrol such as like your sticky traps or we introduce uh, useful pests such as ladybugs to, uh, to consume these harmful pests. Lah. And as for the weather, uh, because we obviously can't control the weather, but uh, for crops who relatively can't do well in uh, Singapore's weather like your lettuces, we do introduce uh, systems such as chiller to cool down the water temperature for them to uh, grow. Lah. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Ferlin. Um, first question is, how many crop recipes that you have uh, right now? Okay, so uh, we currently have around uh, 15 to 20 crop recipes because we have previously tried uh, many different types of crops and we have mm. gathered this data to have these uh, crops data like what you mentioned, yes. Okay. And, and the current app that you have, right? Uh, what, what is the capability of the app? Is it, is it just like a marketplace or, or what, what else does it, does it do? You mean the, 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 the yeah. software? Yes. Uh, currently, our software is currently live in our phone right now. Okay. So uh, it's currently uh, doing okay. Like it's able to receive and give us... Uh, what does it monitor? Okay, so it monitors... Uh, pH, EC, it also measures uh, water temperature and the water flow rate. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then uh, these readings will be able to turn it into graphs. So it's able to generate into graphs for uh, week, weekly, monthly, and uh, eventually yearly for us. Okay. And, and, and this data, I mean, you're, you are collecting it for what yes. purpose? Uh, we are collecting it for for future data so that we have this uh, historical data generated so that we can track at which point you know cause uh, different days the readings will be different as well so we can know like okay so let's say the hottest day the EC will spike up and then we need to bring it down or the pH will go down and we need to bring it up so that we can ensure that the plants are growing at the optimal conditions 24 7. All right. That means right now the reaction is, is still manual. You guys have to go down to the tower to adjust certain things. Uh, through the app, we are currently developing an auto do dozer for the nutrients. Okay. So that we don't have to physically go down. So we can just, from our phone, just tap and then it will just uh, automatic automatically uh, top up the nutrients to the desired range for the plants. Okay. Nice. Um, Lastly, the, if, if anybody wants to go and have a look at the tower, where they can where can they go to? Okay, uh, we are currently located at Ubi, so 26 Ubi Road 4. Okay. If you are interested, you can speak to me later. I can send you the address. Then you can visit us anytime. Subscribe first. Uh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, subscribe yeah. first. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. One question. Uh, yes. You were comparing yourself to some of our best in class. Yes. <laughs> And you claim to beat them, right? Low, yes. Right? You say, well, you PUT, right? Wow, well, you're so cheap and good. Yes. <laughs> so what is your X factor? I didn't quite get that. What, what made you do that the rest cannot? So Sustainer has been in this business for the last five years. They have a big ah, okay. R&D team. So, but for Sustainer, because they are doing uh, indoor farming, yeah. so uh, their electrical cost is actually really very high. Yes. So, uh, but for us, we don't have to factor in the electrical cost because we are using the solar panel and we are doing it outdoors. So, like twelve okay, hours so, a day. So let's we are do outdoor. the like for like maybe this sky greens. Ah yes. Right. So sky greens, their structure, their systems, uh, setup cost is very high, and because they are doing uh, vertically like us vertically, but they're doing a frames. So their system set up itself is a very, very costly as compared to our towers. Yeah. So well, maybe the, the other way to ask, uh, is there any downside in your system? Uh? No, I mean, then I should be taking away all their grants. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I give it to you, right? <laughs> Correct, no? Then we will change the we will change the way, you know, how these things are grow. I'll make sure all the urban farm will give you the space and help you scale up. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. but surely there must be something, right? Uh, something that you have. 
Okay, of course, uh, for now, our towers itself are still in the prototyping stage. It's not yet uh, at a co commercialized uh, space yet. So uh, I can't disclose you the, the limitations of our towers, of course. But uh, yeah, if you wish to know more, we can have a talk later on. <laughs> Let's speak to my uh, officer at ESG for uh, grant, grant application. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have a question online. Uh, we still have a question. <laughs> uh, we have a question online. They want to know who are some of your current customers? And it would be interesting to know how existing customers run their business. Is there, uh, do they sell it to their friends? Do they sell it to... Or, and then the second question is, if they can't sell this 40 kilos, what do they have to do with these 40 kilos of vegetables? Okay, so there are two questions, right? First is current customers. So uh, we have ventured into B2C before and also B2B. So our B2B, we uh, previously have uh, Urban Pillar, who we have partnered to off, uh, them of taking our vegetables at which they uh, sold back to their customers. And then currently we have uh, in talks with Urban Origins, who wish to do the same as well. So as for the second question about uh, what would the coal farmers do with that 40 kilograms of vegetables? So uh, obviously they can uh, share with their friends and family. Okay, so just to clarify that 40 kilograms of vegetables, they are not taking it one shot. So that is too, too crazy for them. We are gonna deliver it to them uh, weekly instead to break it down further so that they don't have to consume the one whole 40 kilograms. So each week is around 10 kilograms. And uh, is that amount is good enough to feed like a four, four to five family, four to five member of a family la, per week. Yes. Why don't you just grow and sell to the market? I'm just curious. Instead of a subscription model, since you're so confident, you grow la, and then compete with them. Oh, okay. Uh, like there's another model, right? Yeah, yes, yes. There's, there's another model they have considered before. La. So uh, we... Oh, okay. Oh, uh, we want to try, we want to see this uh, coal, like uh, this farming is a service model of what we call, because uh, we do speak to those people I have mentioned that they actually want to, they actually want to have ownership of a farm. They want to try to grow a farm of their own, but because of the, uh, like they don't have enough money or they don't have enough time to maintain. So that's where we provide, we try to fill that gap for them to, for them to, fulfill their dream to actually own a farm, but without paying that much. Yes. Sorry, um, I, I think I might have misunderstood or, or not, not too sure. I just want okay. to clarify. So if I were interested to do this, do mm -hmm. I need to have a rooftop or the rooftop is provided? The rooftop like, is provided. So but I will need to access your rooftop yes. to collect the greens. Why don't you do it for me? So I just... Pay for any, then you just, oh, you mean just by solely selling yeah, your system? Then it becomes like a kind of investment for me because I, I pay you $200, you sell it at $400, I take the $200, right? Ah, okay. Uh, because if all of our towers are at our site, mm -hmm. it'll be easier for us to do any sort of maintenance yeah. because uh, logistics costs at all will be uh, very much of a, will be a high cost for us. So by heritage, having all the towers at our site and then you come down, it'll be easier for us to do any sort of maintenance or, or any like, uh, yes, uh, upgrading of the system. So is there any issues of accessibility because these are rooftops, uh, safety and, and- Of course uh, we will have rules. Do you own the rooftops? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the site that we have right now is a rooftop. So obviously we'll do, uh, so only those who are the co-farmers will all, what we'll intend to do is to uh, have an app so that they can uh, access. So they will be registered first and then only those with the, they are certified to come up, then we'll have to do checks and then they, they have the access to our farm star. So uh, with, the co with this co-farming model up, obviously we have to limit uh, our farm a little so that it will be accessible to everyone. So only those uh, co-farmers have the access to visit the farm. I see. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. So now we've come to the last presentation. Uh, our last presenter is currently in Vietnam, uh, but he has recorded his pitch so that we would be able to hear him clearly. Uh, the last company we have is Marinas. Marinas is looking at sustainable cultured gastronomy. Sounds very, very complicated, but he'll explain to you exactly what he's trying to do.
Sorry, just give us a minute. Sorry, Richard, can you play on your end? I think you need to share, share your screen and be okay. Yeah. Yeah, share some as well. Have you thought about why do you crave that tasting menu at a Michelin star restaurant? On first class flight, what is more indulgent than caviar and champagne? Nothing can quite match how caviar pop and release that unique flavor in your mouth. Luxury food is hard to produce and prices often go through the roof. At Marinas, we culture luxury food to recreate the experience. So you and I do not have to choose between indulgence and sustainability. Today I'll discuss the cost challenge of culture foods, how delicacies make food desirable, and if you listen to the end, which airline in the world uses the most caviar? Before we begin, I want to introduce the founding team. My name is Alan. I'm a bio major and a Chicago Booth EMBA. I raised more than 300 million in agri consumer alternative proteins. Xiang Lang is a serial entrepreneur and biotech investor. He raised 200 million from GIC, Vivo, and Novo and created the first culture meat facility that is commercially operating in the world. We have secure advisors who chair the world's largest producers of pangasius and tilapia fish and help beyond impossible and PepsiCo with engineering scale up. Investors want to back defensible culture meat technologies, but meat may be too cheap of a product initially. A peer review paper estimates the cost of production is around $100 per kg of complete animal cell protein under certain conditions, and short term production costs will be multiples of that initially. We focus on luxury food with single cell type and simple mouthfeel. So the price is higher, but the cost is lower than meat. Once we achieve a gross profit, we can truly scale and become a platform for mass market products. If you fly first class, would you accept vegan caviar and sparkling juice? Luxury food actually come with artistry and tradition, and dinner hosts go to great lengths to impress their guests and serve delicacy, even if the delicacy might cause cruelty, pollution, or diseases. Culture food can be authentic and sustainable, so we can make exquisite food more exquisite. By pricing at a premium, we get better unit economics and a better budget for sensory formulations. We combine by our process formulation and sensomics to create opulence and marinas. We have identified access to equipment and know-how in each step of our workflow. First of all, we have access to sturgeon fish. We also have experienced cell line scientists who want to work with us. 
ESCO has multi-million dollar cell line creation and ISO 22000 culture food facilities. Our other partners also have analytical chemistry and food manufacturing capabilities. So our investment dollar can go straight into R&D instead of buying expensive equipment. We prioritize product based on technical and economic realities. We like product with low animal cell mass and simple mouthfeel, so it's cheaper to recreate. We like garnish products, so restaurants can make a bigger profit. We love easy to use product with multicultural demand, so every chef can serve them easily. One of the products we are working on is caviar. As you can see from the diagram here, Unlike meat, which is packed full of cells, there's only one small egg cell in red per fish roll, with the rest being mostly oil droplets in yellow. Our translational research can create multiple monetizations. We can create cell lines capable of multiple applications beyond caviar. We can create culture media and bioprocess patterns. We can create formulation know-how for luxury foods, and we can create gastronomic brands and customer relationships. Why are we doing this now? Well, culture food is now possible, but direct and indirect costs combined is still very expensive relative to conventional foods. And luxury food prices are inflating faster than ever. COVID and conflicts are disrupting food logistics, especially Russian caviar. And Singapore subsidized deep tech for food security. So we're doing this now to take advantage. Alternative protein is a $36 billion market and caviar and substitute trade is around $1.2 to $2.4 billion. Wholesale prices for premium caviar in Singapore is around 1,000 to 1,500 USD per kg. It takes around 10 years to farm a sturgeon, which is much less efficient than livestock and seafood farming. We estimate that sturgeon farming can create some 4 million tons of CO2 per year. You may think, oh, how about wild caviar? But actually it's already banned because sturgeons are endangered animals. And as I promised at the beginning, airlines are actually the largest consumer of caviar, with Lufthansa groups accounting for some 5% of global production. I want to create a global movement to make culture gastronomy desirable, starting with the premium market, so it can become a profitable category for mass consumption. If you are a scientist, who share our vision. Please ping me a DM no matter where you are. We would love to meet. If you are venture investors looking to back defensible culture meat technologies, please let us know how you can help us. Join us on our journey to recreate indulgence with science. Thank you. All right, thanks, Alan. Uh, Alan apologizes that his video cannot be on because he's in rural Vietnam, uh, but he's joining us online. Alan, could you say hi? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, Eugene, would you like to ask the first question? So in terms of the customer base, Alan, have you, have you attempted to sell to any customers yet on, the, on your caviar? Um, thank you very thank you for your question. Um, we discuss um, with various food services, um, both on the premium end and on the meat end. So there's what I call mass prestige, where um, they're not the kind of free star Michelins, but they are expensive nonetheless. Um, I think that for most type of food service of this nature, they are looking for a marketing push so that um, the caviar that they use would have contain a marketing story that helped them to attract food traffic. Um, and in particular, 
as you know, cafe is often paired with beverages, and beverages is often the highest margin product in uh, food services. So I think that um, at least based on my personal experience, having worked in the food sector for 10 plus years, um, that is the angle that we are going for. Um, and we also spoken with a number of uh, food distributors, of, um, especially premium seafood products. Um, they, their view is that the story may work subject to the taste. Um, and of course, we need to improve the product sensory experience uh, to a standard that is comparable to, um, to the local products that are available in that local market. Um, in Singapore, I would observe that um, there is a high quality of caviar products. So um, I, I, was, um, I was invited for some fine dining uh, some weeks ago in Singapore. Um, and um, I would say that um, like these products are not necessarily the highest grade as well. So I think there is, uh, like even in, if in the caviar space, there is uh, different subsegments uh, which we can tackle. And of course, like which level of uh, subsegments we can tackle ultimately depending on marketing success and our sensory experience. Thank you. My other question is in terms of your target audience, your target customers, do you think you're going for the customers who value the high end and are willing to pay and see this as a substitute? Or you're going for the mass market who typically will not have access to these? Because that would affect your marketing and your pricing and your branding. Right? So yeah. Which um, are mm, you going for? Uh, thanks. Um, I think that it depends, ultimately, it depends on the food services that we work with because we are not marketing it necessarily directly to consumers. Um, I would observe that there are two types of consumers. One type is that, um, that the food services would like more is to create demand so that there are probably the types that who don't necessarily consume caviar regularly, but that would like to try and maybe even to try as a tasting experience to compare with the conventional caviar. So that's, that's one group that I think is quite attractive. Um, and of course, if you are really competitive enough, then we can go for the like super high end. Um, I think that some people have raised the questions that, oh, um, um, people who can afford the real thing want the real thing and don't care about sustainability. Um, so I, I've heard about this storyline a few times. Um, I would observe that it depends. It's true that some people would look at it like this, but I would also observe that Actually, um, the like wild caviar is really known as a premium product, right, in the market, and and then followed by Russian caviar. But if you if you look at the airlines of the world right now, um, almost all of them are using Chinese or Italian caviar. So um, and of course, like even when I was young, like aquaculture foods were were both unsafe and you know, untasty or, or inferior. Um, I think that that kind of reputation has been uh, shaped off. I mean, by now, I hope. Uh, for the majority of consumers. So I, I would say that um, there will be a shift in this type of observations or this type of uh, stereotype. Um, and the how successful and how fast this will go will depend on like market players in, uh, in this sector. Thank you. The final question, just a fun question. Which airlines, in your opinion, serves the best caviar? Uh, honestly, I don't know because I haven't tried that many airlines so I have caviar. Um, uh, but I, I can tell you, a funny answer is that uh, once a long time ago, someone on LinkedIn invited me to see a Russian farm uh, for the matter of like transactions, right? So I, I did go and uh, the farm was okay. But what, what was really exciting was that I bought a lot of uh, duty-free caviar back uh, from, from Russia. And uh, so we bought these really big teams um, of different qualities. And then we were drinking them with uh, beluga vodka. Um, and we literally were eating them like rice uh, because we had like, like I wouldn't say multiple kg, but like close to one kg, and that's really a lot for 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 a few people. So um, I can't tell you which airlines, but I can tell you that the grades of caviar uh, do varies, um, and there are different ways to grade them, and it's not just beyond species. It's actually looking for like color, taste, and the mushiness of caviar. So I hope that answers your questions. Alan, I think when a government official asks you that, the answer is always SIA. Yeah, yeah. Regardless of whether or not you actually... I haven't, I haven't, I haven't tried. I haven't tried. Um, I'm, still, I'm still collecting the miles. So <laughs> give me time. I have only lived in Singapore for a short period and I'm trying to use more SIA, but it, um, I haven't flown enough yet. All right. Thank you. Uh, John, for your next question, please. Hey, uh, thanks for the uh, interesting presentation. So I, I wanted to know what's your timeline. Um, I, 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 
I suppose you don't have the actual uh, caviar yet. Um, and how, how soon will we be able to taste it? Um, then, of course, the other question that I wanted to ask also is um, in terms of um, challenges of creating, I mean, to, to actually have this uh, cell, uh, this egg, um, how are you going to control the taste of it as well? I wanted to understand. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so that's a, that's a long question. I try to answer it one by one. Um, on timeline, um, I think that creating a cell lines, that creating a well-characterized uh, robust cell lines uh, will take around two, two plus years uh, from the time you can get your hands on the animals in the lab and so on and so forth. So that, that may also take time. Um, the, the challenges, I think there are a few fold. I mean, actually, I would say the first challenge is getting the right people. Um, there has been, um, as you know, there's been a lot of talk in this sector. Um, and what we observe is that uh, creating a cell line is a massive challenge for, uh, for startups around the world. Um, and that um, finding the right scientists, uh, the right developer to, to both understand A, the marine biology, but also B, like the, the cell biology is actually quite hard. Um, Fortunately, we uh, between Excel and myself, we have some experience in this sector, as you know, um, and we have had discussion with like around six different parties who are, in our view, have real potential of being able to do this. So we are very excited because of that, and we are very fortunate that some of them are quite keen to work with us, and we are trying to develop um, an arrangement as soon as possible. Um, so that's like the first part of your answer. So, and the second one is like, how do you control the taste? Um, control the taste, there are, um, there are of course, number of ways to do it. So the, the easiest way is you have to control the formulations so that you have food technologies to dose in different quantities of different types of oils and tastings uh, who, can, who can recreate the taste. Um, secondly, you can, um, you can, grow the cells in a certain way to encourage them to provide uh, a to release or secrete a certain taste dense, um so that you you know you you, you there's some science involved of course but you have to stimulate the cells in different ways to encourage them to produce that the taste that you want um, and thirdly of course like, there is uh, analytical capabilities so um, one of the things that i learned quite recently is that actually um, there's a whole bunch of sensomics capabilities both in singapore and in the rest of Southeast Asia, where um, there are like a wide range of analytical machines that are uh, used in this type of uh, uh, studies. Um, and you can use molecular chemistry to basically characterize the taste and identify uh, what type of chemicals will create what type of taste. Now, um, of course, different chemicals may interact. So it's not like, it's not like one chemical, one taste, um, but there is um, there's a whole bunch of science doing it and of course the flavor house in Singapore are very good at it and um, Singapore has for, for multiple reasons have encouraged a, a good ecosystem of, of flavor innovations and what we have discovered also with some of our advisors is that some of the existing businesses also have similar machines that are used by um, uh, by this kind of analytical camp and perhaps we could um, we could arrange to access these machines and to speed up our research and also to reduce our capital expenditure so that uh, uh, within when we raise money, the, the goal is to to focus on R and D instead of buying machines and you know, fitting our labs. Thank you. Hi, Alan. Um, yeah, it just feels a bit weird talking to a QR code here. Sorry, um, <laughs> I will ask my question anyway. Um, I'm I'm just curious about the technology. Uh, in th how different it is. Uh, when you are to cultivate uh, a caviar, I mean, it, uh, cell line into caviar as compared to cultivated meat, right? Because just now you show that each caviar or each row is a single cell encapsulated by, by, by oil. So how do you distribute that or, or separate them when, when, when you grow them? Um. Oh, thanks, Anton. Um, it's nice to see you. At least I, I can see you. So um, <laughs> normally we meet in person. So um, very good to see you again. Um, there, are, um, there, there are a couple of things that I would highlight. Right. So um, for me, there is um, obviously, as you know, multiple cell types. So um, you either have to culture them separately and then put them together in, into some kind of structure, 
or you can try to cold culture them and and both of them are quite hard um, as you can imagine um, caviar has only one type of cell to my knowledge and that's the egg cell um, and in fact even the egg cell may not be um, a major contributor to the taste so um, I, I can't go into a lot of details but um, but what I have observed is that certain types of cells may be uh, responsible for the oil droplets creations so there are two two pathways here one is that you uh, you try to culture the egg cells or the oocytes um, as we call them in biology and then hopefully that they taste well, taste right or you can try to improve the taste by different techniques that I mentioned or you can just directly go for the tastings in the oils and the oil themselves so that you can encourage certain cells to secrete the oils um, in which case then you have the taste right there um, these are the two kind of uh, kind of two sets of major differences that I see um, and of course like um, like we will have less of a like texture challenge so there's there's the there's the technique that we need to develop for uh, encapsulation so that the kind of the spheres will will crunch like the real thing um, but of course like uh, a lot of a lot of vegan caviar has done that already right so it's not it's not um, it's not it's certainly doable um, and and the other side is that we it's not like meat where we, we have like fiber and like different structure and like marble and that kind of stuff so like we feel that basically i'm creating or at least i'm trying to create a cheaper thing something that's cheaper to make but more expensive to sell and um and of course like as you know i've been in food industry for many years and um like the idea of getting food that has a story and that can scale and that's cheap to make is extremely important um even in the in the world of like sturgeon farming right thank you ellen all right we have one question online uh, the question is, other than caviar, is there another product that you might have in the pipeline? Uh, what else is next? Um, mm, the short answer to that question is yes, we are considering other products. Um, but um, I would say that these products are going to be um, expensive things that have simple single cell type and like low cell mass percentage. Um, and there are a number of candidates that we're considering and try to understand the science uh, i don't want to uh, i don't want to i want to be scientific honest to say that um we if we do announce it then we would have a realistic view that we could be done um or this could be done um so we don't have that convictions right now but um i think there are a lot of other products out there who could uh sustain or who could promote this um uh, a sustainable gastronomy uh, movement thank you all right. Thank you, Ellen. And with that, we've come to the end of our uh, presentations. Uh, what we'd like to do now is that while the judges have already given their score, we'd like all of you to also try and scan the QR code. Uh, you know, your vote counts for 50% of who wins today. Like I said, it's not just going to be a pitch presentation, right? Because where's the fun in that? You know, we're Singaporeans. We grew up competitive. We have, you know, been pushed to the limits. And today we're pushing all our startups to the limits as well. So the scoring will be quite simple, right? The judges have already given their score. That accounts for 50%, and the rest of you will count for the other 50%. Okay, uh, we'll make the, the picture a bit bigger. Give me, give me a second. Okay, and if you were not here earlier, uh, the, well, judges try not to vote again, because it's, <laughs> it's a double vote. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so if you're not with us earlier, like I said, today the, the grand prize really is $5,000. Uh, and we really want to just support the teams in the next endeavor, right? Uh, it's Okay, it's okay. Don't worry, the wine's still safe. Uh, what will happen is that uh, these funds will really go towards future development of their products. There might be rental of lab spaces for some people, uh, future marketing trips. I think there are many different opportunities that we can provide here, all right? So for those online, feel free to take part as well. Uh, just give you guys a few more seconds. I see some of you still typing. Uh, in the meantime, judges, could I collect the, the slip from you, please? <laughs> uh, startups, you can vote, but just not for yourself. If you brought more people, try not to vote for yourself as well. <laughs> Okay, I see some people still trying to scan the QR code. We'll give you another minute.
Okay, if you haven't voted, uh, I will highly encourage you to vote because right now our top two companies are only one vote away from each other. Uh, so if you haven't, yours could be the decision, the deciding factor, okay? Once that comes in, I think Rachel will give me the, the go ahead. Okay, while Rachel is preparing the gift, uh, we'd like to hear, you know, just a, a, a few more comments from the judges. So we'll give them some time to have <laughs> their comments. Sorry, Anton, could we invite you to give your oh. comments? <laughs> Yeah, sure, you can use your own mic. And then after Anton, maybe John, if you have some words to say for, about the event as well. Yeah, I, I, I mean, especially for me, I think uh, I, I really like the, the diversity of, of what we are seeing, right? I mean, when we talk about agri-food, sometimes uh, we forget that agri-food covers really a wide spectrum uh, from, you know, you're very upstream all the way until the food comes to your table. Um, so I'm really glad to see the, 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 the five teams. I think they did very well at least on my score sheet they are quite closely scored okay so, so um yeah uh, and 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 really uh congratulations uh because i also got to see three months ago where were you guys at and uh today i think is really i have uh shown uh tremendous uh progress so congratulations uh john comments oh uh just want to congratulate uh Trendlines as Thank well you. as uh, the startups that presented uh, really well done in your pitches and also uh, very exciting to see you know where, where you guys have guys have, have progressed as well and um, really hope that we could uh, be part of this as well and um, I think uh, what we really need is you know talent uh, and, and that's why I see most of them are, are struggling looking for this talent um, but also I think um, you know, I, I, I just wanted to say, you know, you guys are doing something that is really meaningful and, um, you know, just continue to persevere. Um, you are in a very good ecosystem already uh, and together with Trendlines, um, I'm sure you will succeed. So all the best to all of you. Thank you. Uh, Eugene, would you like to say a few comments? If not, that's also okay. No, not yet, not yet. We're waiting for you. <laughs> We're trying to create more suspense, so <laughs> yeah, we get some comments about your thoughts about today. Yeah, no, I think the I'm quite impressed with the suite of proposals today and the pitching. So well done for everyone. I think you're all winners in your own rights. You come up with different ideas and in different contexts, I would say. I was also impressed by the diversity of the projects, right? You have different areas from traditional agriculture applications to aquaculture, alternative proteins, urban ag, and food innovation, right? And even then you have things like artificial intelligence testing, deep science in, as well as systems and processes. So I continue to encourage you to find the right context where some of your solutions can be deployed. I, I, I think finding the right problem statements is important. And I think you have attempted to do that in each of your presentations. So kudos to the coaches and the Trendlines team for helping you do that. There's a joke. Right? One time I was doing this in my early days, I was uh, overseeing some grant applications and there was this livestock farm who came in. You know, and uh, the moment they said they were doing AI, I got very excited. Wow, AI in livestock farm in Singapore. I wonder what's that, right? So my ears perked up. And uh, only towards the end, I realized I was the only one that was left wondering why. Because AI in that context means artificial insemination. <laughs> so I was in the wrong zone. And I was like, wow, AI, they make the two things, the animals, then got third animal come out. Wow, I was very impressed. But, uh, so context is important. And I think finding the right areas to be able to use your quite innovative, very innovative solution is, is going to be the key for your next step. So I wish you all the best. And I think credit to the Translines team for doing a very good job in ensuring that we've got very high quality submissions today. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Steve Rhodes, the Chairman and CEO of the Translines Group, uh, to well announce the winner, present the prize, and also to give his closing remarks. So Steve, this is the winner for today. Yes. <laughs> So, 
So thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm really excited to be here for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, to hear these great presentations, but this is also the first time I've been in Singapore now in almost two and a half years. And so I wanna thank the government of Singapore for lowering the restrictions so I was able to come. And uh, it's just really exciting for me. I'm very happy to be back in Singapore after not having been here for a long time. When, when the Trendlines Group first started investing in uh, agri-food technology, almost 12 years ago, uh, no one else in Israel was doing it. There were only 40 startups in the whole country at the time, but it seemed obvious to us that it was a space that had to grow. And in fact, today there are over a thousand startups in Israel in the agri-food space, and it's incredible what's happened. And we're seeing the same thing happening, I think, in Singapore. When we first started looking at the area, talking to ESG and to Tamasic four years ago, again, it was very, very much in its infancy. It was very small. And today I think what, what's happening is incredible. Uh, and the companies we heard today uh, demonstrate that. It, it doesn't surprise me to be truthful because the problems are enormous. The problems that the world is facing are enormous. If we think about it, food is the only product on the planet that 100% of the population of the world consumes. Um, and yet there are enormous problems. A billion people go to bed hungry every night. Uh, climate change is making it more and more difficult to produce the food we need. And, and we have enormous problems uh, with food security. In fact, in Israel, we're now suffering because as a result of the conflict in, in Ukraine, we 50% of our wheat comes from Ukraine or Russia, and it's causing an enormous disruption in, in our local agriculture. So the concerns about Food and food security are universal. And the only way to address it really is through great technologies that are going to lower the carbon footprint of agriculture, increase productivity, and do it in a sustainable manner that also along the way provides healthier food for the world as well. Huh. So when I look at the five presentations we saw today, I get really excited. Uh, we heard about the diversity and it really was a very diverse group. Uh, I wanna congratulate all of the groups that presented the presentations were great. The companies are amazing. Uh, they're very much at the beginning of their path, but I think they all have tremendous potential. It's a shame that we have to only give the, uh, the prize to one of the five, uh, but that's just the way life is, I guess, sometimes, because really all five of them are winners. And I think in the end, the Singapore is a winner. And, and we all, whether we're in Singapore or Israel or anywhere else, we all benefit when people come with great ideas that will improve uh, the human condition through better agriculture and better food production. So I'm really happy to be here and I'm really happy to be announcing the prize, although uh, I wish I was announcing it for five companies and not one. So let me just, like the, like the uh, Academy Awards, right? I'm gonna remove and see, <laughs> and the winner is, it even says the winner is. <laughs> Someone was afraid I wouldn't understand that that's, that that's what this was. Uh, congratulations to all five companies, but pr particularly to Wasna. And Matthew, we, we have this small check for you. <laughs> the, the, the size of the check is in inverse proportion to the amount of money involved. So, so when you raise $10 million, it'll be a very, very small check. So it's still a very important amount. <laughs> Congratulations. All right, and with that, we've really come to the end of the entire presentation. As always, uh, here at the Trendlines Group, we really invite you to take a bite. Uh, regardless of whether you're an investor, early stage startup, late stage startup, these are the people that you should contact. Uh, for investors, if you're interested to find out more about the funds that we have, the fund manager in Singapore, uh, please write to Anton. Uh, you know who I am. Sarai is really in charge of revenue stage companies. She's currently based in Israel, but she'll be able to link you up with anyone you need to meet. So regardless of who you are, once again, please do contact us. We're more than happy to make your acquaintance. Uh, if it's your first time here, if it's first time in our office, even first time with the ecosystem, we welcome you to really this agri-food tech ecosystem. Uh, as well as for those of you who are new, uh, there is this giant WhatsApp agriculture, you know, that's going around right now. Uh, honestly, we've sort of lost track of who's in this group. So if you're not in this group, uh, do reach out to Anton and myself. We're more than happy to add you to it. Uh, that's one of the easiest ways to get information about the ecosystem 
as well as to really just keep up to date, right? So we share fundraising stories, we share success stories, failure stories. I think this journey is really uh, lonely or tiring if you do it alone, but with the right ecosystem, we really uh, can, we can get a lot further, right? So thank you everyone once again for coming. Uh, we have prepared some refreshments here as well as drinks, right? Uh, for those online, thank you very much, but I'm sorry you won't be able to enjoy the refreshments with us. Uh, for those in person, uh, networking can always be a little bit scary, okay? So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're just going to do a quick hand raise so that we kind of categorize people. So if you're looking for a certain sort of person, you can go straight to them, all right? So for the first group, uh, if you're with you know, a government agency or IHL, could you sort of raise your hand so that other people could see who you are, they know who to speak to? All right, these are the guys that you want to speak to, okay? Uh, if, you're an invest if you see yourself as an investor in this room, uh, someone who's able to provide some financial support or guidance, uh, please raise your hand as well so that you know, startups can look for you. <laughs> yeah, I realize the investors don't raise their hands that high. <laughs> uh, if you're a startup and you're here because you want to meet more you know, people, get to know more people, can you also raise your hands so that you know, investors who are looking to make investments could come? Are there none in the audience? I see collapse. <laughs> okay. Uh, and lastly, if you are here really to provide a service to startups, I know there are some lawyers here, uh, please feel free to go and reach out to some of the other startups as well. Okay. So once again, thank you all for coming. Uh, and I hope to meet each of you during the networking session. All right. Thank you, everybody.